Welcome to the Green Goddess Podcast, where we explore sacred medicines and the evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Tara. Today, our guest is Becca Williams. Becca Williams lives in Denver, Colorado, where she facilitates cannabis ceremonies, and she works with clients one-on-one with cannabis to achieve emotional liberation. Welcome to the show, Becca. Thanks, Tara. Thank you for having me. I'm really grateful that you're here. I was very excited to hear about you because the two of us do uh, very similar work. I do similar work in Portland, and um, it was just really neat because I really don't know many other people that work with cannabis in a sacred and uh, ceremonial way for healing, for transformation, and for spirituality. It's just not that common. So when I heard that you were doing this, too, I was very excited. Yeah, we're really niched down. And, of course, your work is well known up there in the Pacific Northwest. You know, um, it's it's getting there. But I started out with just a meetup group and I was doing cannabis ceremonies um, and just for friends before it was legal, too, for a while. So now that it's legal, it's pretty exciting. Yes, it's it's uh, it's out of the closet, so we can actually speak about it freely. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm really passionate about sharing that cannabis is a spiritual tool. I think it's great that um, there's awareness now that cannabis has so many medicinal properties for the physical body and um, with CBD for the emotional body as well. Um, but I think you call it supernatural. I would call it mystical. I think that aspect of cannabis has been less celebrated, but it's just as important. I agree. And, you know, I call it the third wave of cannabis in the sense that, of course, we know that recreational or as it's called now, adult use uh, is the first wave. And the second wave is medical. And the third is the arena that you and I are in. And that is conscious cannabis, as I refer to it, or psycho-spiritual use of cannabis. And it's just, it's the leading edge. And a lot of people in a lot of places are not there yet. Right. It's it's often um, when I have the meetup circles, it's often really surprising to the people that come that anyone else even has thought about cannabis as a consciousness tool. Mm-hmm. And uh, and 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 I do get uh, quite a bit of correspondence, people uh, asking me about meditation and saying that I I would like to learn how to do it or I've experimented and I, I it's not been optimal for me and I'd really like to find a way to connect the dots on it. Uh, it's yeah, and so so it's getting out there and people have a lot of questions about it because I think that heretofore uh, what uh, what has been uh, in in that realm of exploration uh, consciousness exploration if you will that people think in terms of using it for a walk out in the woods or a hike or creativity and well that certainly can be very quote unquote meditative i believe that in order to really affect deep uh, enduring change and healing we need to go inward and and it that that really is a conversation around somatic listening, going in and and listening where uh, to, to to what's happening in one's body. And so often, so many people uh, lead their lives by really working hard not to go inward, because well, for one, mindfulness meditation can for a lot of people, and it was for me early on can be boring. Uh, a mindfulness meditation in the Buddhist tradition and many others, um, I'm told there's like 5,000 different kinds of meditation around the planet, and there's about 30 that are well known here in the United States. And what we know in the Western mind is the quiet sitting, the contemplative, where we're watching our thoughts move through. And when they stop, 
we need to keep moving them through. And when we have the busy, distracted, driven, ambitious culture that we have and somebody says okay you really need to meditate and a lot of people know this based on the the science and what other people say how it really has calmed them and soothed them but it, it's almost you know I've tried it I can't I can't even tell you the number of times people have said I've tried it and I just can't do it uh, because I just can't sit and I was the same way with the mindfulness, um, contemplative meditation. Um, and I, uh, because that's the portal, right? That's the portal to calming oneself. And I tried for years, for decades with that approach in, tran in transcendental meditation and Buddhism and Kabbalah. And, uh, and I, just, I, I just couldn't do it. And I felt like a failure. And so uh, bring it around to uh, how I incorporate the cannabis with a very active form of meditation. It's kundalini-like. I call it industrial strength meditation. And I'm getting, a, I'm getting a, a little bit off of our subject matter here vis-a-vis -vis cannabis. But I do want to say that cannabis is so wonderful compared to all her what I call big sister psychedelics is that she really is very malleable and embraces uh, the frameworks very well. And so my framework with this industrial strength meditation, when we are able to, uh, to incorporate and amplify with, um, with micro doses of cannabis, CBD um, rich, uh, it can really uh, give us a, a springboard uh, for going into that supernatural place. Yes, and it's funny to hear you say big sister medicines because um, I got this message once from ayahuasca that she called cannabis little sister. So that was, to hear you say that was really resonating. That's funny. Yeah, yeah it, it makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> and It, it does. And, it's, and it's, very, it's very controversial in regard to how people embrace the 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 big sister psychedelics and and cannabis and you know there's different schools of thought where ayahuasca or or other psychedelic journey medicines um, they will say um, a shaman will say no you do not use cannabis yeah. and then there are others right. who say bring it on yes it's much more common that that uh, cannabis is looked down upon by those who are very serious about ayahuasca and the other medicines. I hear that all the time. Um, yeah, facilitators, when they're screening you and having you prepare for a ceremony, will often, you know, class that as a drug or intoxicant like alcohol that you should not be using or touching because many people have used it in a way that was not healthy and not promoting balance. So there's this association with it. But at the same time, you're right. Um, there are also traditions that do bring cannabis into ayahuasca and do ceremony with cannabis. I've heard about, um, I think in Brazil, that they are they are using um, cannabis and there's ceremonies specifically to cannabis and that it's brought into aya ceremonies. Uh, I read about that too in Stephen Gray's book, Cannabis and Spirituality. Yes. There was that. There were some pieces in there about that. Yeah. Um, but to get back to what you were saying about meditation. Um, yeah, I think cannabis is an amazing catalyst for meditation. Uh, personally, I discovered that CBD, I guess that's really more hemp. So really high CBD strains um, really helped me with detaching from thought and being able to get beneath the mind and into the heart and find that core center of inner peace and then really just be able to breathe into it and then later without the cannabis it was easier to come back to that space i agree so i think yeah i think cannabis is such an amazing tool for meditation really helps with putting a little bit of um, distance between thoughts and feelings and awareness i uh, I we're also I, i'm a clinical nutritionist uh also and so the clinician in me really looks at the biochemical individuality of us all. And 
where some of my clients and students will be uh, very uh, impacted by hemp oil or, or CBD oil, whatever whatever we're calling it uh, these days from whatever quarters. I do like a little bit of THC with it, and it potentiates, actually, in my experience and my students' experiences, it potentiates uh, that CBD, the CBD's ability to relax the fight or flight response, to yes. really open us up and make us very receptive and more spacious. So usually my work is with a cultivar that's two uh, two to one CBD to THC, all the way up to 20 to one uh, CBD to THC. Again, depending on what the 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 participant uh, the participants' needs are in my ceremonies, because I like everybody to be in the the field, the same field. I do uh, use a two to one. And I, I look for um, a, a more uplifting uh, strain. And w- we know the whole combination around sativa and indica that it's, uh, we're not supposed to use that anymore because the strains have all been crossed. And there's, you know, uh, uh, an indica actually is, can be uplifting and a sativa can be sedating. And <laughs> it's, it's uh, we need more terminology. Right, right. Yeah, and especially there's so many hybrids. Right, it's been hybrid uh, and hybrid and hybrided beyond recognition in some instances. And, you know, when I'm, uh, uh, you're in Oregon, correct? Right. Yes. And I don't know what it's like there, but here in in Denver, uh, of course, we're on the we're on the tip of it, of it all. And even at that, when I go shopping at dispensaries and I have some favorites and and there are a couple and one in particular that offers organic it is it is really difficult it's often catch as catch can to get high CBD flour and that's the first question out of my mouth anytime I walk into a dispensary is what do you have in the way of high CBD and probably more than not more likely than not they will say we don't have anything so it's mm-hmm. it's it's really um it's really a challenge in that respect. How, what are you finding out there? Yeah, likewise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have a particular yes. favorite that you that you use? Um, well, you know what's cool is there is a dispensary here that's um that I like that is um it it sells a uh, flower that its owners grow and the owners are yogis. So that's really cool. Oh, the best. Um, mm. Yeah, that's the best. It's grown, you know, intentionally outdoors, um, organically and, you know, with consciousness. So that's, that's the ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a few like that, which I'm really grateful for. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the experiences that people are having in these ceremonies and why they're so valuable. Yes. Yeah. So why don't you take us through what a ceremony is like for you? Yes. So my work is called emotional liberation and it's premised on the fact that it's a cross between Eastern psychology, Eastern psychology, uh, um, philosophy, spirituality, it's all one big ball of wax in that ancient uh, Eastern psychology. Uh, uh, And in Western science, we just look at, you know, the medicine. Uh, I'm sorry, we look at the uh, the, 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 the pieces, so it's not holistic. Yet what we're finding is in Eastern psychology, and when I say Eastern psychology, that is short for that ball of wax of Uh, psychology, philosophy, and spirituality. And they uh, talk about uh, through meditation and through the active meditation, the kundalini-like meditation that I use, uh, what we do is we stir up the energy body so that we can actually bring up 
the uh, this, the 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 blocked the energy blocks and we can meet them as I say and greet them so that we can release them and it's a beautiful thing because now Western medicine and science is endorsing that and it's settled science that trauma is stored in our bodies trauma is stored in the tissues of our bodies and so when you uh, it, it really is in different terminology or different language that uh, Eastern psychology is saying the same thing so the million dollar question is all right if it's lodged in our bodies and we need to move it through how do we do that and there are various practitioners, various medical doctors, various researchers like Peter Levine uh, with his somatic experiencing, Scott Killaby with living inquiries on how to move that up and out. Uh, yet it's, it's slow and it's methodical as it should be as a science, but I find my work that was taught to me by a Kundalini master of of 30 years um, that that we really need to uh, move it through and how do we do that and this meditation practice is very efficient and effective in doing that because we're using the breath we're using hand positions which are called mudras and sound and the ancient wise ones say that our own sound is most healing to us so we do that in the form of mantras in my playground of Hinduism and Sikhism and mantras are sets of sacred words that when chanted actually further activate the energy body with the combination of, of breath and movement in order to get in to these energy blocks get in to this uh, uh, this embedded trauma and really bring it up so that we can move it through and that is what we do during a cannabis elevation ceremony or a elevation ceremony because there are people all over the world countless people who do these practices without any kind of outside agents and hit the moon but I have found in my experience and it's all experiential as we know that cannabis amplifies and expedites this process and so what we do in the course of a ceremony with that premise on the table is we move through these practices um, that are uh, that are very ambitious as I say industrial strength meditation uh, we uh, we use uh, micro amounts of cannabis again it's up to the individual I always say to all of my participants that they are the boss of them they are driving their bus and while I create a nurturing and very safe and legal that's important for a lot of people environment it is up to them to take care of themselves ultimately uh, because uh, if if once we actually start um, flicking the switch on on the emotions moving through we've never actually uh, a lot of people have never actually paid attention because it's so scary because emotions like well um, anxiety and anxiety and fear and anger and sadness and depression and self-doubt um, it hurts to actually go there and that's why we are such a distracted and addicted society is because we do not want to go inward and feel this in fact research has shown that the pain of difficult emotions is just as painful as physical pain physical pain can be centrally located right uh, site specific but the pain of an emotion just flows over us and it's uh, it can be very scary and uh, pretty tormenting so to uh, what I do <laughs> is when people come to me and they are roiling with difficult emotions a little bit or a lot 
And I know from personal experience that I lived like that for most of my life up until about five years ago. I woke up with anxiety in the morning. I went to bed with it at night and my day was punctuated with it, along with depression and sadness and a lot of self-doubt, a lot of a huge sense of unworthiness. And so I healed myself, released this trauma from this work, and when everything opened up and I surrendered to it, uh, what was very clear is that I wanted to help everybody in this world who wanted the help uh, to, to do this work, this releasing work. So I am in a, a ceremonial, and a ceremony is very important um, because we don't have ceremony in our in our lives, in our Western lives, uh, generally speaking. I think that that's why people are flocking to uh, South America and Africa and availing themselves of indigenous people ceremonies. Uh, well, that is uh, lovely. I, I think the Western mind is different and needs a different kind of ceremony, and that is what I have done. I have created that. So in the context of an evening of ceremony that is very meaningful, not empty rituals like a lot of us have grown up with in, um, in, 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 in religions, uh, that, um, you know, remember, you know, <laughs> reciting the Lord's Prayer or whatever, you know, whatever that might be. And just kind of like uh, uh, thinking about something else. Well, I mean, I remember as a kid being in church and, and doing that. And my head was, a, you know, a million miles away. But I was going through the recitation of the various prayers. And I, I because I'm so sensitive to that, I do not want anything meaningless in my ceremonies. So everything is very meaningful. And so as we move through it with, um, with cannabis uh, amplifying for those who want it, um, and it amplifies, it expands the feelings as we move these emotions through. And because we so, so many of us uh, do not uh, uh, work really hard to keep these emotions at bay, when we invite them up, as we do in ceremony, they are like, you know, a line in a Jewish deli where you have a number and you go, me next, me next, me next. And that's where people need to take care of themselves because once you start inviting these emotions up, they are, they just want to be heard. And in my framework, that's the, that's what we want to do. They want to be heard because when we take the deep dive and start listening to our emotions, they are our inner guidance system. Very much like if we put a hand on a hot stove, our nervous system will say, hey, baby, that's hot. Get your hand off. Um, so our emotions are difficult emotions. This is a, a an incredible code breaking um, cutting edge understanding of why our difficult emotions are here. And so we just, we, we, we invite them up so we can move them through and they really start, uh, they really start talking to us when we sit down with them and say, here, I'm listening to you. Tell me what's coming up. So when, if there's anxiety, uh, ongoing anxiety and a, person can actually tap in through this 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 deep inner exploration that we do and start talking to the emotion and get answers then we can actually and are able to release that emotion so that it's not tormenting us anymore and the more we do it the more healing takes place. Right. And I love, I love everything you just said. And it is so much about simply witnessing and being with those energy blockages in the forms of those emotions and then they can release. Yes. And a lot of times we don't know how to do that. And this is a codified step-by-step -step approach to doing that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, 
So my personal ceremonies with cannabis look very different, but my one-on-one work looks a lot like that. Um, So that's really interesting. Although I don't use your, um, of course, your specific meditative techniques, kundalini and chanting and such. It's just interesting that we're doing kind of parallel work, you know, and this is the first time we've really even talked about what we do. Well, maybe talk a little bit about yours. Um. Well, I, I only want to bring, I'm really interested to talk to you. The only reason I'm bringing it up is just that it's interesting that um, there are so many things in common with the way that we're working with the medicine is it's just leading us to this. But at the same time, I also personally really love to work with cannabis as a um, mystical tool. Do you do that at all? Do you work with it in terms of exploring the energy body or opening up to other divine frequencies and and energies and entities and things like that? I keep it pretty simple, uh, Tara, in the sense of we could go into the various bodies and the, the, the full out and out Sanskrit names of the chakras. And I just keep it really simple because that's what people want from, from me. And the simpler I can make it, the better, the easier and faster for them to get into it uh, with the ability to do it. And so in regard to that, I differentiate just the physical body with the energy body. Energy body representing everything else beyond the physical body. Okay. Yeah, I think cannabis is an incredible tool for emotional transformation and energetic transformation. And um, yeah, I think great value that way um what i've been enjoying as well though is really uh working with it as a teacher and working with it um in order to get into the heart space and really stay in the heart space and from that location which it helps with um so much detaching from the mind getting into the heart um and amplifying our subtle sensitivities as you said it's an amplifier amplifies those hidden emotions and sometimes it amplifies the subconscious mind which is just really useful for transformational work especially when I do the transformational work I bring in Reiki and shamanic tools and so it's just an excellent complement but at the same time there's this other potential that I love exploring which is really the potential to have visions the potential to open up to those more subtle frequencies Um, so I've done ceremonies where, uh, for example, um, we just sat and we breathed into the heart space and I love to bring in other plant medicines. So, and I'm thinking, you know, when I say this non psychoactive plant medicines, so I've brought in tinctures and just other types of plants and herbs so that we can get to know the spirits of those plants and herbs with cannabis as the amplifier. We've had some really neat experiences of messages and visions and things like that coming from the other plants or even just coming from cannabis. People have seen like past lives, um, you know, just gotten spirit guide messages, imagery, um, just all kinds of really neat activations and transformational changes. The last cannabis ceremony I did was this past weekend. And we did a karma clearing and a journey into no self. And I love cannabis for that because for me, it's really been a huge teacher on detaching from the concept of self and then coming into that that source feel that's really within each of us and moving into that state of the present moment. There is no past. There is no future. There is no time. There is no self. Moving into that place is just fantastic with cannabis. That's it's a lot of potential for that kind of creative use. That's awesome. Your your skill set is awesome. For me, it's a little simpler than that because, again, I I came from just dial it back a little bit here. I came from a very dysfunctional childhood, one that was volatile and violent and unpredictable. And as a result of that, that trauma, there were a lot of difficult emotions uh, that were anchored by that, that trauma. 
And so when I was introduced to this work five years ago and started seeing the remarkable, the, the, the spectacular results of, of, of being able to release these emotions and becoming more calm and more centered, um, that is what that that was a way station for me in the sense that if I can live the rest of my life out in calm centered clarity on this earth, then that is great for me. And I believe that the people who come to me, my students and my clients, long for that also. So on my website, which is, by the way, uh, Becca, BeccaWilliams.org, my website uh, says that enlightenment can wait. Uh, deal with your difficult emotions now. And I think that uh, our culture is reveres this thought of enlightenment and what that might be. And we spin a lot of our wheels trying to get there when in fact we are simply very clouded with difficult emotions anchored by trauma. And we just need to first and foremost get that out of the way. And that begs the question then, if I am able to navigate in calm, centered clarity, does that mean that that's enlightenment? I, I don't know the answer to this question. I just know that once I healed, the first thing that went away was the fear of death for me, and then everything else followed. And when you have no fear of death, for me, after I was able to clear myself and release these difficult emotions, it was, I am ready. If a meteor shower hits me later today, I am ready to go into that vast, that vast and infinite ocean of energy where I came from in the first place. And this is the yin-yang of the universe, the rhythms of the universe. And when we can understand that and embrace that, uh, life is heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that's my particular perspective. I, I don't spend a lot of time on, uh, on going, uh, taking people uh, beyond um, you know, the lower, the lower chakras, the higher chakras and the crown chakra, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it feels good up there. Um, a lot of teachings are premised on that. Um, and then coming back. Um, and so it can almost become like a, a party trick. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's not what you do, but I'm just giving you my, my honest, uh, my, my honest perspective on we spend so much time uh, trying to get up there thinking that that is going to be our salvation when in fact it's the stuff that's stuck in the energetic body and the physical body that we need to move out that makes us feel so much better. So I'm sort of a, a one show pony. In that regard, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's great. I think what you're saying is very valuable and what you're doing is extremely valuable. I think it's really excellent that you're um, creating this intersection of uh, the Eastern traditions, you know, and this um, Western need for healing the emotions and connecting with the emotions and facing the emotions and doing it in this very innovative way. I mean, it's a very unique thing to be doing. Um, so how long have you been doing it? Well, I met my, my dear friend and developer of emotional liberation, uh, Guru Mayer uh, Singh Khalsa, uh, who, as I said, is a Kundalini master of 30, 40 years. He's, He's uh, one of the most compassionate, brilliant uh, people I have I've ever met. And he, 
he created this. He's been a long time yoga, kundalini yoga teacher. And he, uh, you know, uh, better not go there. I was going to say that I was going to say that he's beyond his teacher. But I think that that's probably what we do do in this work is we actually take what's already been established, whether it's in uh, Eastern psychology or it's in Western uh, science. Uh, uh, Eastern psychology has a different way of bestowing honor on predecessors of work, because as you know, you know, there will be pictures of predecessors that are put on an altar behind the teacher. And then in, in Western medicine, it's really about just referencing their work, right, in the, the studies that they've done. Uh, so it's, it's quite different. So um, my teacher uh, has really come down in the middle of all of this. And I had been introduced to him as a synchronicity because I was asking, I was asking, I was pleading for answers so that I didn't have to live with this, with these, these, these emotions that were constantly at me. And now having said that, I was a very high achieving driven professional. I was a, a television news producer, executive producer, and uh, also a reporter. And uh, when I realized this huge healing uh, over a period of about uh, three months in and I would wake up and the anxiety was gone, I knew that there was something to this. And I just uh, I, I wasn't a big meditator uh, before I, I, I met uh, my friend, uh, my teacher and uh, and started doing this. Uh, because of that whole mindfulness meditation thing where just I was so I was so distracted, I was so dissociated when I sit down sat down, I would more like probably redecorate my living room in my mind than just sit there and watch my thoughts go by. And so when I started doing this and actually I included the cannabis because oh since college, um, many moons ago when I was introduced as a I was a girl from Iowa and went to college and was introduced to cannabis. And it, I found huge relief in, uh, in cannabis um, and, uh, and used it uh, for the rest of my life. And, uh, and when I was introduced to this work, what I realized was that cannabis is what we call palliative, which means, well, well, it's in your system or well, your mm, uh, well, well, the psychoactivity is there. Uh, you feel better or you, you know, a lot of people uh, don't like that. Don't don't like the THC. Uh, but for most people who are who have been using it, a lot of people use it for PTSD. Right. right. Yeah. And. Uh, and so I started including these uh, these ancient Eastern Kundalini like practices and using small doses of cannabis. And what happened is and this is this is my um, this is my experience and students and clients experience is that it is curative. And you've got to be very careful as a clinician saying that word permanent healing. Um, you got to be very careful about that. But that's what I realized. That's the difference that cannabis actually amplifies and potentiates the 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 strength and the usefulness of the practices. But it's the practices where you're stirring up uh, the emotional body and the physical body and bringing that uh, that distress to the top in order to let it go that that can be permanent healing. And so what goes around comes around in matching the cannabis with my emotional liberation work. Now, having said that, my that that's my twist, right? That's my 2.0, if you will, on emotional liberation. My teacher in his teachings and his teacher, uh, there's a very strong no substances policy and I, uh, I was, it was important to me to be able to be very honest and straightforward 
with uh, my teacher and let him know this. And to his credit, he was uh, open-minded and he knew that I had the, you know, I was a clinician and I knew the science and I could share the science with him. And so he's very, he continues to be open-minded. He says, that's not what I do. It's outside the realm of my teachings, but you but you, dear Becca, as he said, and I have this disclaimer on my website uh, from him, um, you can do whatever you see fit. And so that's what I've done and, and have gotten wonderful results from it. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. I mean, I think it's really cool to be innovative, you know, and bring what we are feeling intuitively guided to do to existing structured and that's that's part of the fun of being a human right it's creativity oh that's so, that's lo- that's lovely how you say that because it really is about experimenting and if life is an experiment you cannot lose if life is an experiment you cannot lose but so many of us have been inculcated to believe that the future and, and whatever is new is scary and you need to be very afraid. And that is about anxiety, right? And paranoia, which is fear of the future. And then there's shame associated with that and self-doubt. Um, so, uh, so, so it's really, and we can't change that perspective of a person until they are able to release the underlying feelings that are driving them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that point. I think you've really driven home the value of using cannabis for emotional transformation. And I agree with you. I've seen some really profound things happen, particularly in my one-on-one sessions. Um, And particularly, for whatever reason, uh, many of my clients have tended to be men. And a lot of the work that I've done with them has been around releasing the um, conditioned suppression of sadness in that that a lot of men hold the feeling that it's weak to cry or that um, it's it's somehow unmasculine or something to feel those kinds of feelings. Um, And so a lot of men have chronic pain in the physical body that's actually really just suppressed sadness because of societal conditioning. So I've seen cannabis really help people get in touch with that stuff and then actually shift uh, the physical body so that there's no more chronic pain issues after a good cry. And it can be really profound for people to see like, wow, this one hour session where I had maybe five minutes of weeping actually completely cured me of this thing that I've been carrying around for months or years. This Mm -hmm. pain, not knowing, or this feeling of disconnection. So it's it's very deep and useful in that way. It's it's, it's like, very I, clear, yes, it, uh, that uh, that that and, and Gabor Mate, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, has done excellent work on this. He's a Canadian uh, who is really a trauma expert, um, and he, he he has concluded that, and I think there is some research that is that is underscoring this, uh, that. The, uh, the physical pain, the manifestation of disease is directly related to the trauma burden that we're carrying. So once oh, you start releasing the difficult emotions slash the trauma, then actually you, start, be, you begin to start healing on a physical level as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I've seen that as an intuitive healer, too, without cannabis. Um, I've seen people come in with chronic pain or disease and heal it based on addressing the unresolved traumas from their past. I've seen that many, many times. So I Mm -hmm. agree with that. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah, I think um, what's fun too about cannabis is that um, it is more than just, it has potential for many different directions. You know, cannabis has played a huge role in music and art. It's, it's just tremendous in its ability to, to open our horizons, you know, and bring us new ways of being and new experiences. And so that's why I love to pair it with spiritual transformational work. That's not just about healing, but it's about um, changing our consciousness and experiencing different states of consciousness that can lead to liberation and that can lead to interconnectedness with other beings only, I only work with the light, of course, but, you know, other beings, other nature beings, 
other plants, um, our higher selves, angels, ascended masters. I really love to help people to explore and feel these other frequencies and receive the gifts that are all around us. I think cannabis just has so much potential in so many different directions. It's really exciting. Beautiful. Uh, what beautiful work, uh, Tara. And as you, you, you uh, mentioned, uh, Stephen Gray, um, editor of Cannabis and Spirituality, the book, because there's very many uh, writers in, involved in that book and different perspectives, mm-hmm. uh, he calls it the people's plant. And, yes, the, the people's psychedelic. And, and, and what I believe is that cannabis is here for us in the midst of this this space where we are going through tremendous upheaval. Uh, often many point out that we're in the midst of a paradigm shift. And, uh, and, and, and of course, if you know, the, the plant is here to help us do this. And if you notice the plant has, has people growing millions of acres of her, uh, which is, uh, which is pretty eye opening when you look at it from that perspective. And that I go back to the three waves of of cannabis, and that is adult use or recreational, as it's often referred to, and medical and psychospiritual. I believe even uh, it's all here for our well-being, that the plant is here across the board for our well-being, because people who are you know, the old term stoners or getting baked or whatever that looks like. Um, I would rather have somebody um, uh, baked uh, uh, into the couch, right, as it's called, <laughs> and, and using it as escape rather than anything else, uh, alcohol, opiates, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, uh, whatever that might look like, those are polluting and poisoning one's body. And cannabis, you know, I, I tend to think she takes these warm, nurturing arms and puts them around someone who's looking to escape and maybe wants to be uh, wants to be as stoned as they can always all the time uh, because life doesn't feel good to live straight. And that when that person, has made the decision that they actually want to move in to reality that she just kind of loosens up the plant does and lets that drapery fall so that the person can actually reconnect and so even when we see you know the psychological dependence on the plant i believe as far as the choices are concerned out there for escapism it is the best it's an interesting thing you know i i really have no judgment for anyone that's that finds themselves in an addiction cycle or you know medicating with whatever because honestly i think the reason people are drawn to drugs in the first place is they're looking for medicine is there something within us that understands that these plants um and, you know, in the modern age, also these synthetic versions of plants, um, you know, have have medicine in them to whatever degree. And I agree with you. I think cannabis being an actual plant has a lot more to offer. Um, and it's it's spiritual um, and emotional sort of energy of nurturance has a lot of good to offer. But it's also, you know, like when people are reaching for that stuff, it's like there's pain and then there's a desire to be free from the pain. There's exactly. Yes. Right. And there's this, I think, innate sense that um, medicines are going to help. And that's true. I mean, I think one of cannabis's amazing functions, I certainly find I take CBD every day. It, It does help me tremendously. It helps me to connect with a sense of love that's in the universe, that sometimes it's hard if you're in your head or you just may be disconnected. It's hard to sometimes feel. Um, As you said, it's really helpful for the nervous system and for getting out of that fight or flight state. Many of us live in that state, especially people that love coffee. Um, And when you're in that state, you can't really feel the love of the universe. You can't really feel that connection. When when people work more closely with me, I actually uh, give them um, 
uh, hemp oil, CBD oil, because it is so nourishing uh, to the endocannabinoid system. And, uh, and, and being able to, and going down the science rabbit hole, but when you can do that, you can create uh, more receptive receptors on the endocannabinoid system and more of them. And what they're finding in this cascade of research now is that the endocannabinoid system uh, is in intricately intertwined with, I don't know if I could say, all of the other systems that, you know, if you're one foot in front of the other on science, but for sure the nervous system, for sure the GI tract. And, uh, and so uh, for me, it's very important to have a client or a student uh, doing that with regularity. And the reports back um, are, are, are so fulfilling um, and there's so much, uh, cause and effect in using the cannabis oil that, yes, uh, as a clinical nutritionist, it is a staple for me in my medicine cabinet for clients and students. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. The endocannabinoid system, that's that's a fascinating piece right there. So mm -hmm. it's, yes, so interesting how we have our, our, our natural innate cannabinoids in our bodies, essentially. Yeah, and I'm assuming that some of the the rituals that you do are so like uh, maca, uh, ma, ma, what's the chocolate? Help me out here. The the name of chocolate. Uh, cacao. Cacao. Thank you. <laughs> I just had the the syllables uh, scrambled. Uh, cacao uh, feeds the endocannabinoid system big time. Oh yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm so. Who knows what you're potenti uh, potentiating when you do that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So we have this um, one endocannabinoid called anandamide in our system. Anandamide. It's our bliss chemical. Yes. And eating cacao does indeed trigger it. It's so wonderful. That's why eating chocolate is so divine, literally. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, anandamide uh, is, uh, I'm sure there's an interesting backstory because it was an Israeli, Israeli who named it. So um, I think that might have been Raphael Mashulam, um, who actually, who actually discovered the uh, in the endocannabinoid system and THC. At least his team did. So um, and then they they named they named that endocannabinoid <laughs> anandamide <laughs> bliss. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. The in the research coming out about the effects of CBD on the endocannabinoid system are really profound and, and fascinating on, on the system itself. I think we're going to start to see that actually cannabis is even a preventative medicine. It's anti-inflammatory. Oh. It's yeah, it's, it's got incredible, incredible healing potential. No question. Yes. We're in a, yeah. uh, we're, we're in a beautiful, uh, a beautiful age to be living through this. I mean, there's a lot of turmoil that is going on, but the the sort of, uh, what do I want to call it, the phases from coming out of that and going into essentially what you and I have been talking about here, a new age, uh, and, and being able to be with the various medicines uh, to ha help facilitate that in our work is spectacular. Thank you, Becca. I really appreciate what you're doing and what you're saying, and I think it's really great to frame it in terms of the different waves and um, awarenesses coming out there. I think it's so important to get education about cannabis's potential and awareness out there about cannabis's potential and all the good it can do. I think we're just scratching the surface of it. No question. Uh, Tara, could I offer your uh, your listeners a gift? Sure. Uh, in the way of my work is emotional liberation. And uh, what I would like to offer is an emotional liberation strategy session, complimentary, so that you can understand what you have been doing isn't working and be clear on the next best action to take. Because struggling through life is is no fun. And so if one is interested in doing that, you can just go to my website. I think that's probably the easiest. 
and uh, uh, BeccaWilliams.org. And just in the subject heading, uh, put emotional liberation. I think that's easy enough. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you, Becca. Of course. It was really interesting. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear about the way that you work and what you do and your work with cannabis. I know you're a cannabis advocate as well. Oh, yes. Big time. Big time. Yeah. I mean, thank I, you for I, the work I, that you do. I moved to Denver before, you know, when it was when it was legal. So I can't. Uh, I have to be careful in, in tuning my horn because there are so many people's shoulders who I stand on in order to do this, uh, to do my to do my work. Uh, but I'll be moving to Florida shortly and they actually have medical uh, and there is a drive to uh, to 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 legalize uh, adult use recreational. So I look at I look forward to yes being an activist in that arena. <laughs> excellent, excellent work. Thank you. Yes, I think it's very important that we bring cannabis forward and celebrate and elevate her and and share with as many people as we can um, who are receptive. You know the incredible healing benefits that this plant has for us. There's many, uh, many, many people getting on board more and more every day because they, you know, they may have been through the war on drugs and people of a certain age, whether it's millennials who are through D.A.R.E. programs or through the war on drugs and they're in their, you know, they're baby boomers and they're in their uh, late 70s and 80s or whatever. But when you see somebody benefiting from it, you want to you want to know more about it, right? And it, and and you get to a point of saying, "I want that too." <laughs> so it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Tara, thank you so much for your work. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm just beginning, you know, in many ways. Even though I've been doing the ceremonies here and there for a number of years, I still I feel like it's just the beginning. There's so oh. much to bring forward. It's a vast experiment, and uh, it's lovely to uh, to be on that magic carpet ride. Yes. Okay, well, thank you, Becca, and thank you to all of our listeners who have joined us today to hear about your work and our work with cannabis as a psycho-spiritual tool for healing, for transformation, and really for sailing off into to other dimensions, too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to do more shows about cannabis. I think we're just scratching the surface here. In many here, ways, here. yes, absolutely. And I, I'm, I want to say, very excited because I think that the legalization and embrace of cannabis as a healing tool across this country and I'm sure the world is really going to change the whole planet. From your lips to goddess's ear. Yes. <laughs> and I like to end our show by saying, "May the plants be with you." Thank you. Yes.